Hello viewers, welcome to the new session on Fine Arts Painting of Indus Valley Civilization. The plastic art of Indus Civilization must have begun in the Paleolithic Age and continued to that of Mohenjo-daro, Harappa, etc., which, according to widely accepted chronology, belonged to a period not earlier than the second half of 3000 BC. The latest evidence suggests that civilization of Mohenjo-daro and Harappa lasted for about 800 years until the 17th century BC, although the chief centers of this civilization were in the Indus Valley Indications suggest that it extended as far as north as the Punjab and northwest Pakistan and may have included all or part of Rajputana and the Ganges Valley. The civilization, under reference, called variously as Indus civilization, Indus Saraswati civilization, Harappan civilization, is believed to be the contemporary of Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilization. Though there is evidence of interchange of goods between Sumerian, Mesopotamian and the cities of Indus Valley, Indus civilization remains distinct in terms of writing, town planning, religious beliefs, etc. About the first half of 3000 BC, two significant cultures named Zob and Kuli have flourished respectively in north and south of Baluchistan. The terracotta figurines of these Zob and Kuli cultures are recognized as the earliest efforts of plastic activities in India. These two cultures appear to coincide with each other and later overlapped with the Harappan culture of the Indus Valley. Terracotta figurines of Kuli and Zob. The plastic art of Indus Valley is mainly known for its dynamic naturalism, which is believed to have begun with the peasant culture of Kuli and Zob and reached its mature state at Harappa culture where its appearance is extensive. A fair number of terracotta figurines of animals and women have excavated from these sites. Among the animal figurines, those of the bull are the most common. It is assumed that they had a religious association with the animal. Figurines serving as children's toy also appear among the objects from Kuli culture. Objects like bird whistles, also have been found due to contacts with Harappan culture. The terracotta female figurines are made by pinching up or pressing down the clay by fingers according to the requirement of the form. The archaic treatment of the face or ant body, a conventional position of hands on either the waist or the breast may suggest some ceremonial or ritualistic association. The flat bases of these figurines indicate that they were intended to be set up on some kind of platform. It is suggested that these figurines were meant to represent a female divinity connected with fertility cult of ancient times. Among the animal terracotta figurines of Zob culture, the humped bull predominate. The bull figurines are more or less of the same as Kuli. However, they are sturdier and show features implying a mature naturalistic sense. The female figurines of the Zob Valley indicate certain development in technique and production of terracotta. An attempt toward more naturalistic representation of the face is seen in the indication of mouth by an open slit just above the chin. The face is further characterized by a high, smooth forehead and deep eye holes, which were probably intended for insertion of pellets to serve as pupils. The Zob and Kuli figurines show elaborate headdresses and jewelry, all separately executed and then applied. A schematic treatment of stripes is noticed in the painted cattle figurines from Kuli site. It is apparently recognized as a sequence of plastic tradition of these both cultures with Harappan culture in their later phase. Harappa culture, representation of form in relief as well as in round were among the achievements of Harappan civilization. The materials used were terracotta, bronze and stone. It is noticed that bronze and stone are found to be developed, stylized and far ahead of the traditions expressed in the terracotta figurines. A survey of Indian art by S.K. Saraswati observes that 
it is possible that the former represents a popular plastic idiom of the commoner people following the terracotta traditions of the peasant culture of Zob and Kuli, while the stone and bronze sculptures represent an art of the higher section of people. In Harappa, terracotta female figurines are carefully done. Attention is given to detail and finish. The techniques and stylization are similar to that of the peasant culture of Kuli and Zob. Eyes are made of two separate pellets, mouth of a small strip applied to the face with a deep straight indentation to indicate the lips and breasts are shown by separate pellets by cones. It is observed a greater elaboration of the headdresses and hairstyles as well as of ornaments. The Harappa figurines do not represent only busts with flat bottoms below the waist. These figures were fully modeled with hands and legs. In the figurines of peasant cultures, the hands were attached to the human body. Sometimes they rest on the hips or on the breasts, but in the Harappa figurines, they are completely detached. They either hang down or carry something with one or both hands. Hence, Harappan figurines suggest a greater freedom of movement. Secular figures such as female kneading doll, nursing mother, crawling child, etc. also appear among Harappan figurines. A small percentage of male figurines also have been discovered. The male figurines are commonly found seated with hands either on or round the knees or joined in front in an attitude of devotion. Very rarely they are shown standing. The techniques employed in the production are the same as that of female figurines. In taglio figures of animals come to form the most characteristic design on the seal. It leaves a striking mark with the objects of Harappan civilization. Seals are made of steatite in square and rectangular with inscriptions. The inscriptions are in a script and still remain undeciphered. The figures of the monkey, the ram, the buffalo, the goat, the rhinoceros, the elephant, the pig, various kinds of birds and reptiles are represented on seals. Among the animal figures, the bull predominates and they are either the zebu or the ursus ox and some of them are represented with objects resembling altars before them. It can be related to the cult of bull as a fertility or lunar symbol in ancient Mesopotamia and perhaps as a prototype of Shiva's attribute, the bull nandi. From aesthetic point of view, these animal figures are the most satisfactory of all the finds. They carry a stillness, energy and dynamism within. Though the volume is not emphatic, it can be felt through the expression of the massiveness and weightness of the bull. And this quality of rendering the energy can be felt throughout the tradition of Indian sculpture at later stage. Real or imaginary animal and human figures also can be found in majority of seals. Mostly animals are shown in profile. Sometimes the artist has shown masterly grasp of the animal from along with its vigor and dynamism. According to Stella Kramish, they carry a strain which does not result in movement, but may keep the figures spellbound with pent up energy. In one of the seals, we find a horned deity seated in yoga posture who is probably to be recognized as a prototype of Hindu god Shiva. The trident above his head can be suggestive of Trishula. The suggestion of the central figure surrounded by a number of wild beasts could be a representation of Shiva as a lord of wild beasts. In this seal, we have the earliest recognizable representation of a divinity in human form in Indian art. Also, some seals with representation of horned female figures in trees can be suggestive of Yakshi, the fertility and tree spirit of Buddhist art in later stage. Apart from these, the linear stylization of the trees and a particular mode of rendering of leaves in some seals have striking similarities in later Indian art. Various types of delightful toys, such as carts and chariots, also can be seen among terracotta objects. 
Apart from terracotta sculptures, the Harappa civilization has some remarkable sculptures in stone and bronze. One of the two Harappan statuettes represents a well-known piece of sculpture, the male torso in red stone. The figure is shown completely nude. The head and hands are missing and the legs from the thighs broken away. Frontal in representation, the execution filled with simple naturalism, refined and truthful, particularly in the modeling of fleshy part. The treatment of the back with its subtle curves and sensitive rendering of the volume is impressive. The vivacity of modeling is clearly visible in every feature and also through the entire figure where all parts seem to be organically and dynamically related to one another. At the same time, there is a suggestion of an inner tension recognized by some scholars as a device to reveal the existence of the vital breath within. S.K. Saraswati says that such qualities make up the basic form of Indian sculpture and in the statuette, one recognizes the Indian sculpture's amazing skill in producing not only a sense of plastic volume, but also in representing the soft quality of flesh. The other ha Harappa statue represents a dancing figure and is executed in dark grey slate. The figure now is merely a fragment. The head, hand and legs are missing. The surviving portion suggests one of a rhythmic graceful dance. The modelling is supple together with the sensitive rendering of the volumes and three-dimensional treatments give the figure with dynamic naturalism. Among the statues of Mohanjadaro, copper figure of a dancing girl is unique. The legs are bent with left leg slightly set forward. The hair is tucked at the back in a heavy plate which rests on the right shoulder. There are coils of bangles adorn the left arm from below the armpit down to the wrist. The treatment of back and the hips, the buttocks and legs is noticeable for naturalism in modeling and movement. Another remarkable white lime stone figure represents the head and bust of a male draped in an elaborate shawl like garment passing round the left shoulder. The figure is considered as a portrait of priest. The mode of wearing the drapery is noticed in later Indian art, particularly in Buddha images of Kushana date and occasionally thereafter. In the downward glance of the eyes of this figure, some scholars recognize an attitude of concentration in yoga. The general rigidity of the figure and aspects such as wearing of beard with shaven upper lip shows resemblance to Sumerian heads. And details such as trefoil design on the costume as well as the mode of hair dressing may be matched with Sumerian sculpture. Benjamin Rowland observes that the Indian variants of Sumerian cults, statues and their presence in the Indus Valley reveals that at least some relation perhaps religious as well as stylistic existed between civilization of Indus Valley and Mesopotamia. Architecture of Indus Valley The two largest cities of Indus Valley, Harappa on the left bank of the river Ravi in Punjab and Mohanjadaro on the right bank of the river Indus in Sindh are among the two major architectural sites. The architectural remains were of mainly utilitarian character with a uniform sameness of plan and construction. The building consisted of houses, markets, storerooms and offices. Many of these structures consisted of a brick ground story with one or more additional floors in wood. Public buildings on the citadel would appear different from others only in size. Everything about the construction of the ancient city of Mohenjo-daro shows a total lack of architectural ornamentation. The site was systematically laid out on a regular plan. It was built in such a way that the principal streets ran north and south in order to take full advantage of the prevailing winds. The bricks of the Mohenjo-daro and Harappa are fire-baked unlike that of Mesopotamia but certain architectural features such as the use of narrow pointed niches as the only forms of interior decoration in the Indus are also found as exterior architectural feature in Mesopotamia.
and these are suggestive of a relationship with ancient Near East. But none of the buildings of these cities can be identified as temples or a place for worship. There seems to have been no dominant class of priests or warriors. Fine, but undecorated beaten copper vessels are discovered from these cities. Most of their pottery with these features suggests utilitarian function, though they are some large storage jars with geometrical leaf motifs in black on red are found. Among the more interesting structures of Mohenjo-daro were the remains of a great public bath. This establishment together with the smaller baths attached to almost every private dwelling may have been intended for rituals such performed on the tanks of modern Hindu temples. The regularity of the city plan of Mohenjo-daro and the dimensions of the individual houses are far superior to the arrangements of later Indian cities. There were no fortification, assumed that there was no need for them. In comparison with secular architecture, in Mesopotamia, there is the development of drains in houses and streets. Public services included pipe, fresh water and drains to draw of household waste, as well as rain and flood water. Benjamin Rowland explains, on the basis of these innovations in civic architecture, we are led to the conclusion that the centers of civilization along the Indus in the 3000 BC were vastly rich commercial cities in which the surplus wealth was invested for the public good in the way of municipal improvement and not assigned to the erection of huge and expensive monuments dedicated to the royal cult. Now let's summarize the whole session. Indus Valley civilization shows a sense of dynamic naturalism in its sculptures and seals and a highly developed architectural sense in its urban planning. Many sculptures can be recognized as remote manifestations of the divinities of Indian art in the later stage. The relief and molded figures of this time remain distinct and far ahead of the terracotta figurines of peasant cultures of that time. Numerous terracotta figurines Steatite seals, bronze and stone sculptures provide excellent examples in which one can recognize the Indian sculptor's amazing skill in producing the soft qualities of life and flesh, more than merely representing a sense of three-dimensionality. Now, here are a few assignments for you to work out. Give appropriate examples to show the trade relationships between Indus Valley and other civilizations. Describe the representation of bull in Indus seals and its significance. Describe the sculptures from Harappa and Mohanjadaro. Now, here are a few books for you to refer. Art and Architecture by Benjamin Rowland, Puffin Publications, 1971. A Survey of Indian Sculpture by S.K. Saraswati, Munshi Ramanohar Lal Publishers, Private Limited, 1975. Indian Sculpture by Stella Kramish, Motilal Banarsi Das, 1981. A History of Indian Sculpture and Architecture by Samuel Huntington. The Art of India by Shivrama Murthy, Harry and Abrahams, New York Publications, 1977. Mohanjadaro and the Indus Civilization by Sir John H. Marshall, London, 1931. Indian and Indonesian Art by Anandake Kumaraswamy, 1985. Indian Art and Architecture by Roar Craver. Thank you for watching this session. We will discuss another topic in the next session. Till then, bye.